Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness, your mercy, all your blessings, but especially your word. As we look into the word this morning, I pray that you give us a special revelation. Uh, you've been so good to us. And I just pray for that special revelation in the name of Jesus, that it be a live word for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start with a story. Some of you may have heard the story told about three pastors. They got together and they were going to pray for each other. Uh, the first pastor, uh, with the, they were trying to share their hearts and trying to be able to uh, pray and encourage one another and pray for their churches. Well, the first pastor, the Lutheran pastor, he says, I got to share something, my heart. I got a problem with lust. He says, uh, I get on the internet and look at some things I should not be looking at, and I think some thoughts I shouldn't be thinking. I really need prayer. The second pastor was a Baptist pastor, and he said, now, I got a problem too, he says. Uh, my problem is, I don't make a whole lot of money. Uh, so sometimes, uh, I take some of the money out of the offering plate before it's counted. They come in on Monday, and so I look it over, and I need the extra 20 or 30 or 40 dollars. I just take it out before they count it. He says, I know it's wrong, but um, I, I got a problem of greed. I really need prayer for that. They looked at the third pastor, who was a charismatic pastor, and they said, are you going to share anything? He says, well, to be honest with you, I'm the town gossip, and I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and head to the barber shop. The head to the barber shop, right. <laughs> A little. Anyway, uh, it kind of goes along with uh, you know the whole business of what I'm talking about today, uh, the sting of betrayal. We're in John the 13th chapter, and we're talking about the last days, the last hour before Jesus is actually uh, crucified, and the night that he spent with his disciples and the teachings he shared with them. And so we've been on this for a little bit. So today we're going to talk about the whole thing of the sting of betrayal because uh, we've all had that at one time or another. Uh, I think these two pastors probably felt the sting of betrayal because they knew that their secrets are going to be out. But we've all felt that. You ever had a friend that you had confided something in and all of a sudden uh, they spilled the beans to everybody? That's betrayal. You really felt terrible. Or maybe you got a real good friend and they, they, they betrayed you and you're the trust that you put in them. Maybe they, you prom they promised you something and they never came through with it. The whole thing of betrayal hits every one of us. Some of you and many of you here have been married and had some rough times in the marriage and maybe your husband or wife betrayed you. They had an affair with somebody else and that, you, that betrayal cut deep into your heart. Well, there's a lot of different things we could talk about betrayal, but Jesus felt that sting of betrayal because Judas, one of his closest friends, ended up betraying him. So we're going to talk about that today. We're picking it up in John the 13th chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. Uh, see, he begins with, uh, point number one is, Jesus knows who's on his side. Jesus knows who's on his side. I'm not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But this is filled with the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I'm not saying this to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. Jesus knows who belongs to him. He knows who are faking it, who want to be, who are pretenders. You know, the ones that follow Jesus, some of them just follow them because they're curious. They want to see all the miracles. They want to be fed with the food. They want this or that and the next thing. But there was no real commitment to, to him. Some, like they were curious. Some really wanted to follow him, but weren't willing to put out the energy and the commitment to, to follow him. Then there were those that really were uh, committed to him, the real followers. And at one point, it appears Judas was. Verse 19 says, I tell you this beforehand, so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you this beforehand, 
before it happens because I believe I, it happened so that you will believe that I am the Messiah. Jesus gave many proofs that he was the Messiah. They were all looking for the Messiah. They were looking for this man to come out of the tribe of Judah who would be the, uh, the Messiah, who would lead the people. And a lot of them thought he'd be a military leader. They didn't understand what kind of leader he was going to be. But they'd seen his miracles. They'd seen the healings. They'd seen the deliverance. They'd been fed with the 5,000. They'd seen all these things. Every one of these things was a proof that he was the Messiah that was coming. But not only that, of all the people that ever lived, there was hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament telling what the Messiah was going to do and who he was going to be. And he fulfilled every single one of them. No one else had ever done that. Now he was going to do the one last thing and die on the cross. There's a final proof and then the resurrection. The final proof that he was truly who he said he was. He was the Messiah. Verse 20 says, I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Each of us has been called to be a messenger of Jesus Christ. We need to see ourselves as that messenger. <coughs> Some will receive you, others won't. We can't be intimidated by those that aren't. But if we can see ourselves as a messenger for Jesus Christ, that wherever we're at, we are bringing a message of hope, of deliverance, of healing, of blessing, of joy, of love. That's what God calls us to do, to be that messenger, to reach out to other people's lives. It's not just about you. Jesus saved you, not just to get you to heaven. He saved you that you might be a part of his kingdom and see others come into that kingdom, be encouraged in that kingdom, and walk with him. So we're all called to that point. Anyone who welcomes me, welcomes my messengers, welcoming me, he says. Okay? We are those message, messengers. So walk in that. Point number two is simply this. Jesus knows who will betray him. Verse 21, now Jesus was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will be betray me. Judas had traveled with Jesus for three years. He had seen the miracles, he had seen the deliverance, he had seen the healings, he had seen the people fed, and not only that, he had participated in all that stuff. He also prayed for the healing. He prayed for deliverance. He was passing out that bread that uh, was broken to the 5,000 in one place and 4,000 in another place to be fed. He participated in all those miracles. And so it says, Jesus was deeply troubled. Jesus was deeply troubled because he knew that one of his disciples, one of his apostles, one that apostle means one who sends out. One of them was going to be him. And that was going to be Judas. Jesus was deeply troubled. And he claimed, one of you will betray me. You know, if we knew who was going to betray us, it's always troubling, right? When you were betrayed, weren't you troubled? Weren't you bothered? I bet you didn't get a whole lot of sleep that night, or maybe for weeks at a time. Because you didn't know, what could I have done different? You know, that's a good friend of mine that did this to me. And sometimes it takes a real struggle to forgive that person. And unless you can really forgive them, you're going to have that hurt and that sting of that betrayal the rest of your life. So Jesus knew who was going to betray him. Verse 22 says, Simon so looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. <laughs> I always amazed at that verse. They had no clue who was going to betray him. Now, Jesus knew from the very beginning who was going to betray him. Some say that, you know, Jesus spent all night praying about who the 12 apostles were to be. It says he brought all the disciples together, and they chose 12 to be apostles, 12 to be sent out. Now, some say the first 11 was very easy. But that 12th one, the one that was going to betray him, that was a hard one. And that's why he spent the rest of the night praying because he knew that the one that betrayed him would end up in hell and spend eternity away from 
the presence of the Father suffering in, in hell for eternity. And Jesus had to choose one of them that he knew one of them was going to be that. That had to be hard. It had to be hard. But Jesus knew from the very beginning. Now, remember, Judas was a treasurer. Judas also stole from the treasury. Why in the world would Jesus put Judas as a treasurer? I think he knew that Judas had a big character flaw. Now they all did, okay? We know Peter's flaw. <laughs> they all were uh, lurking out everything all the time, but every one of them had a flaw. And we all have flaws. I believe that Jesus chose Judas to be the treasurer because he wanted to see him overcome that flaw of greed in his life. That's my own thinking, my own thing. But uh, he chose Judas, and he knew from the beginning that he was going to betray him down the road. Can you imagine traveling for three years with this guy, and knowing that down the road, he is going to be the one that's stabbing you back. He's the one that's going to betray you. He's the one that's going to turn you over, and he's going to be the one that causes your death on the cross. But Jesus never let on. Never let on. And it's interesting, none of the other disciples had even a clue about it. Now they're either totally blind, or maybe just dumb, maybe too trusting. I don't know. But then he kept getting the money out of the treasury for his own use. But they never got it. And even when Jesus said, one of you were betrayed, they're totally oblivious who it might be. Verse 22. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom it could be. And then 23, the disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus. That's John at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who was he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Again, no one had a clue. <laughs> no one had a clue. There was yeah. Uh, point number three is simply Jesus reaches out to the backslider. Jesus responded, verse 26, <coughs> it's the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Judas, and Simon Iscariot. Okay, that was often a uh, badge of honor. When the host gave a bread to a person, now I, I was reading this this week, I did not know it, but when they gave a bread to uh, someone and uh, kept it in there, is a badge of honor. Why would Jesus do that to Judas? I believe that even at the last minute, Jesus was hoping that Judas would repent. Jesus was hoping Judas would repent. I think that's why he never challenged him about the finances. Never challenged him about other things. Because he always was hoping that Judas would repent. You know, that's the same thing he does with all of us. His heart was for the backslider. Some of you got backslidden kids, friends. Someone brought one up this, after, this morning. You know, Jesus' heart is still for that person. If you read through the Bible in the program we gave about last uh, January, you're in Luke right now and you read about Zach Zacharias. No, excuse me, Zacchaeus, excuse me. And uh, he was up in the tree, came down, fed Jesus. Everybody's mad at him for doing that. He said, that guy's a sinner. And Jesus said, the Son of Man comes to save, seek and to save those who are lost. I think we need to get that deep down in our heart. We've all got people that are lost, that don't know the Lord, that haven't really turned their life over the Lord, or maybe at one time or another they have, and now they've backslidden. Jesus is hard as always for that. I think that's why Judas, why he gave that bread to Judas. It's one thing to show that this is the one that's going to betray me, but it's another thing because he's hoping Judas at that last minute will <clears throat> repent. And that's with every one of us. Jesus loves us all, and he loves our kids, he loves our, the, our families, and he wants to see every one of us and our families in heaven with him. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to forgive us all our sins, to accept him as our Savior, accept him as our Lord. 
A lot of people just say, I don't know if I want to believe all that. I don't know. I kind of believe it, but I don't want to do anything about it. The thing is, Jesus' heart is for those that have really backslid. He continually reaches out. That's why he reached out to Zacchaeus. That's why he reaches out to us. And some of us have been in a position where we've really gone the wrong way, and Jesus has reached out and enticed us back. He's calling us back to himself. Verse 27. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. That's always a troubling verse, too. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. And then she, Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. We often use 1 Corinthians 11, and this one reason I wanted to have this sermon this week because it is about communion in some ways. And we're going to have communion next Sunday. Uh, we read this almost every uh, first Sunday of every month. It says, uh, you ought to examine yourself before eating the bread or drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That's why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. That's a strange, strange verse. Communion, I really believe. Holy communion. I believe it is holy. It's set aside. It's special. And uh, it's for our healing. I remember Oral Roberts saying that he prayed for thousands upon thousands to be healed. Uh, I've prayed one time with him. Uh, uh, he prayed for me. I was, uh, had a physical handicap and, and was healed through that. But that day he prayed for 10,000 people by laying the hands on every single one of them. That, that day. He did this week after week. The thing is that he said that when I can't get healed any other way, I take communion. And God always meets me in communion. In other words, communion is for our healing. Communion was meant to bless us. Communion was an extremely important thing to give us strength, to give us freedom, to give us healing. But here it says, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. I want to underscore again, if you're not really living for Jesus Christ, please don't take communion, okay? It will be more of a curse on you than a blessing. So God reaches out and we say every time we have communion, you know, give your life to the Lord. Use it as a time to rededicate your life to the Lord. And I mean that with all my heart. But uh, if we take it on word, though, we don't, if we just go through the emotions and, oh, yeah, let's have some... Uh, grape juice and uh, a cracker. You're hurting yourself more than you'll ever help, help yourself. Be careful of that. Verse 28. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Jesus was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Again, Jesus knows our heart. He knows every single one of our hearts. He knows who are his. He knows who are pretending. He knows who uh, are uh, just uh, totally full of all sorts of junk inside him and no desire what to serve, to serve him. He knows who are his. He knows every secret in every one of our hearts. But he doesn't spill those secrets. You know, we'd probably be Gasped, we knew every secret that's in our church here. You know, all the secret sins that we've done all throughout the past. That may be our doing right now. He knows every single one of them. He knows what's going on in our heart. But one of the wonderful things about Jesus, he never spilled the beans. Mm -hmm. He's always reaching out to us and saying, I forgive you. I'll set you free. I want to see you free. I want you serving me fully. So he's always reaching out then. Jesus could have said, hey guys, this is the guy that's going to uh, betray me. Let's beat him up right now before he goes. Or he could have called 10,000 angels down. Strike him dead before he does it. No, Jesus didn't say anything. 
And that's one of the wonderful things about Jesus. He keeps reaching out to us. He keeps loving on us. He died for all of our sins. But he doesn't want to expose them to everybody else. Now, some people get discernment. They get, you know, the Lord tells them something. If you get this sermon about someone else in the body here and someone, you know, that this person going through that, it's not the broadcast that you, hey, I put it on Facebook. This is the problem this guy said. No, it's not for that. Or it's not even necessarily for, oh, prayer meeting. I can't wait to get the prayer meeting to tell people what God showed me. No, it's for your own prayer benefit that if you, he tells you something about someone else, Pray for that person. See that person set free. Encourage that person. Uh, don't let him pray for it. But God gives you that, not to broadcast it, but to be a prayer warrior for that person to see them come through. We need more of the attitude of what Jesus had. Jesus loved us dearly. He died for all of our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. When we come to him and ask him, and when we backslide, he stands there saying, come back to me. I love you. I want you to serve me. I want you to spend eternity with me in heaven. That's why I came. So the whole thing here, the sting of betrayal, it had to hurt Jesus. But betrayal hurts every one of us. We've all been betrayed at one time or another. Someone come against us that we thought was a friend, a supporter, someone that really loved and cared for us, and they turned against us. We all get that. It, you know, it's part of life. What are you going to do about it? Forgive. Go on. Don't let it hinder you the rest of your life. And you don't need to go out and broadcast to everybody else, this person did this to me, you know, you know, to get, you know, a lot of times we retaliate through our tongue and trying to tear that person's reputation down. No, don't do that. But on the other hand, some of you have betrayed others. You know, it's not just all about us. Sometimes we've betrayed others. If you betrayed someone, call out to God for forgiveness, and maybe you need to go get something right with somebody else. Whatever it is, if you've hurt someone and betrayed someone else, Maybe you need to really get that right. And maybe you've tried to get it right and they don't even want to get it right. Okay? That's, that's a whole other story. The thing is, don't let junk grow in your heart where you get bitter, angry, resentful, that you retaliate against people and you're running them down in their character or tell others about how terrible they are. Take the attitude of Jesus. He was deeply wounded. He was deeply hurt. They didn't go black to everybody else. Uh, he loved Judas. Continually reached out to him. Right to the end. He does the same for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just really pray for every single person here. You know our hearts. Some of us have been betrayed at one time or another. Friends that we thought were really friends. and They turned out not to be. There's some reason they're not part of our life right now, so we just dismiss that and go on. We forgive those that hurt us. Lord, where we've hurt others, where we've betrayed others to trust or maybe something else, we ask for forgiveness. We ask you to put your Holy Spirit spotlight on us that we might really repent of anything that we need to. Again, this day we just say, Jesus, forgive me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Help me to forgive everybody that has done me wrong. Help me to let you be the Lord of my life. I recommit my life to you this day without reservation because I know living for you is the only life that's really worth living. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do. In your name we pray. We're going to spend a little more time in worship. If you need prayer, come on up. We'll pray for you. Spend some time at the altar. By yourself if you want. Whatever you need. And uh, as we worship, you just turn your heart to Jesus. Let's stand. I'd like to share something.
You wonder why my eyes blood shot. I had a shot in the beer. I wasn't drinking at Joel's bar. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did tell him that. He said, I told him, he says, your eyes really got bloodshot. I says, oh, I'm a pastor. That's going to look up real good on Sunday. They'll think I was drinking. And he, I go, way to go, Doc. Anyway, I was drunk in the spirit. I really was because 